Thanks very, very much. I'm very comfortable at uh, anything that is called a conservative anything. And uh, although I'd like questions on anything at all that you'd like to uh, uh, that you'd like to ask. I want to devote this period of time, if I may, to conservative philosophy and particularly the flat rate tax. I know everyone has their own way of defining what conservative philosophy is or what it isn't. Let me just tell you not only what I believe, but what I know to be true. That conservative philosophy, as we call it in the United States, is exactly the philosophy of the founders of our nation who believed this that the individual is responsible for him or herself, period. If, if that individual is indigent or unable to take care of him or herself, the responsibility then goes to the family. If the family is unable, then the responsibility goes to friends, neighbors, relatives. If they're unable, then the responsibility goes to the church, the synagogue, and charities. If they're unable, the responsibility goes to the township. If the township is unable to care for this one individual, then the responsibility goes to the city. And if the city is unable, then the responsibility goes to the county. If the county is unable, then the responsibility goes to the individual state. And if the state is unable, then and only then it becomes the responsibility of every taxpayer in the nation chipping in for that one individual. This was called by our founders layered government, that there would be layers of government and that the government would start with the individual and it would end as a last resort with the federal government, which is, in other words, everyone in the nation combined. Lately, Instead of it becoming the, instead of it being the last resort, it has become the first call. A person gets in trouble, sends a form to Washington, D.C., and that's it. This idea, incidentally, of layered government was not original with James Madison or the other founders. They plagiarized it and talked about the plagiarization from the Bible, from Moses. Uh, when Moses came out of uh, Egypt, the, and he had to lead, lead to something like uh, three million people, uh, the only leadership of which he was aware was the pharaoh of Egypt, who was a totalitarian. So it was the only way in which he knew how to lead, yet he didn't want to be a totalitarian. He wanted to be a sensitive leader who would hear all of the problems of all of his people and reach some sort of just conclusion of those problems or disputes. And so he was doing that until his father-in-law, a guy named Yetro, said, you can't go on doing this, you'll go nuts. He said it a little more articulately than I just did, but he said to, uh, to Moses that what you have to do is you have to appoint, you have to appoint from a group of a thousand, a hundred, and from the group of a hundred, ten, and from the group of ten, one. And you'll have this pyramid of leadership, of layered government, in fact, although he didn't use that word. And you will only see those people who have a, the, those kinds of difficulties that have not been able to be solved at a lower level. That was the birth of the kind of government that we have in the United States. As I mentioned, in a sense that's gone. The federal government is now the first call. And the way that it came about, more than anything else, is because of two volumes that come out annually from Washington, D.C., both of them beyond any comprehensibility. There isn't one person in the United States who understands them in entirety. One of them is the income tax code. One of them is the federal budget. Huge volumes. It is my obsession to throw both of those volumes in a wastebasket and start all over again in this way. When the ink, I'll, I'll do it in terms of the taxes because the budget will take care of itself if I develop this properly, which I probably won't do, but then you can call me on it. When the income tax started 80 years ago this year, it had a one sentence justification. And that one sentence was to finance the necessary costs of the federal government. You know, I gotta say, as much as I don't like an income tax, it's valid, 
to finance the necessary costs of the federal government. I understand that. The federal government has to operate. Okay, if I can explain that in one sentence, which I copied from the uh, debate of, of uh, 1913, 80 years ago, if it can be explained in one sentence, why then is the tax code 9,306 pages? Well, it's 9,306 pages because it no longer has anything to do with financing the necessary costs of the federal government, and it has everything to do with giving rewards and punishments to individual citizens depending on whether they do what the federal government would like you to do or you're not doing what the federal government would not like you to do. It is a system of social change and rewards and punishments and has very little to do with its original intent. In saying that I want it thrown away, obviously it has to be replaced. It has to be replaced because we do have to finance the necessary costs of the federal government. And I believe that the best way to replace the income tax as we now know it, which is, as I said, totally incomprehensible. There isn't anyone who understands. No one understands this. The, the way in which it should be replaced is with a, what I call a balanced budget flat rate tax that you could figure out at 11 p.m. on April the 15th and still make it to the post office on time. There would be no deductions or exemptions or inclusions, no nothing. It is just a flat rate, period, on a postcard. At the same time, the total abolition of the capital gains tax, the total abolition of any tax on interest from savings accounts, the total abolition of any uh, tax on interest from anything, the total abolition of inheritance taxes, the total abolition of taxes on dividends, and the abolition of a corporate tax, putting it into a straight business tax at the same flat rate. The flat rate to be revenue neutral, well, let me just, uh, uh, let me back up a bit. There have been a number of bills that have, pre have been presented in Congress, mainly in 1982, when President Reagan was president, advocating a flat rate tax. But all of the flat rates were arbitrary. It was like one of the bills said, let's make it 10%. One of the bills said 20%. One of the bills said, I think, 15, whatever it was. There were, uh, there were 11 bills in 82, and they all had different rates and different little things added and subtracted. And some of them had some deductions and some of them didn't. But the rate was arbitrary, and the rate shouldn't be arbitrary. The rate should balance the budget so that we never again pass on a debt to the next generation. It is the most outrageous thievery that all of us in this room, all of us in this nation, are, are guilty without wanting to be, but we are of stealing from the next generation so that we can enjoy things while we're alive. They're gonna have, the next generation is going to have trouble enough uh, uh, with normalcy uh, of, of a lifetime without having to be born with this tremendous debt which is now four trillion four hundred billion dollars. Okay. If we want it revenue neutral, the percentage would be about nineteen percent flat rate. And then it would be my hope and my belief that through the abolition of any number of departments and agencies, and I have a list of forty four, you could knock that down to what would be a much more reasonable percentage, which would be 10%. The greatest gift of this would not only be to the next generation or this generation's uh, ability to simply, to simply have a postcard rather than that 1040 form, but the, but the amount of time that it would give to everybody's calendar and clock, the amount of time that is spent on income tax work whether it be for an individual or a corporation, is, uh, I've read any number of estimates, and I guess there's no way to, to, uh, to really give a, uh, a precise figure. But it is in the hundreds of billions of hours every year. If all of that time was then used for productivity or uh, liberty, anything you wanted with it, it would make America so much, so much stronger. And the greatest reward of all is this. It would make politicians honest. And this is what I mean by that. Last year, the President gave a State of the Union address in which he told the budget 
the federal budget for the coming fiscal year. And he said it would be five trillion, five, excuse me, one trillion five hundred and twenty billion dollars. There isn't one American, including the President of the United States, no matter whom that President may be, who understood what that figure means. I don't. Had he said it's going to be three billion eight hundred and sixty-four, eight, three trillion eight hundred sixty-four billion, no one would have lost one wink of sleep. But it was one billion five hundred, one trillion five hundred twenty billion dollars. But it doesn't make any difference. The figure is so immense that it doesn't mean anything. I want the president to be able to say in the year 2000, I propose for fiscal year 2001 a budget of 14 and a half cents out of every dollar you earn. Every single person in the United States would understand that figure. And he would go on, I want three cents out of that 14 and a half cents for the Department of Defense. I want uh, uh, two and a half cents for health and human services. I want three quarters of a cent for the Department of Transportation. Uh, and go through the entire federal budget in exactly that way. If he was able to do that, everyone from the homeless to the billionaire would know with precision how much that person is chipping in for the, for the work of the federal government and what the work is that is being financed. And even more important than that, he would not be able to be conned by a politician who may come to his neighborhood and say, I'm running for office and I want to have more money for research for AIDS or whatever he may say, and everyone applauds. Because it sounds fine. No one knows where the money comes from. They say, sure. This time, the politician would have to say, I want one half cent more taken out of every dollar that you earn for research for AIDS. And the applause wouldn't come that fast. And by the same token, you would have to ask yourself and be able to ask the governor of your state or your county supervisors or city hall, your mayor, city council, how much would it cost if we did the same thing for our city or our county or our state? How much money would it, would it cost us to do exactly that? I am convinced that if we had such a system, we would be back to layered government, whereas right now we have a uh, I'll just use this as an example. I'll, I'll use two as an example. Uh, we have uh, education and the environment taken care of on ev practically every locality in the country. It's also become a agency of some kind on a city level, a county level, a state level, and we have a federal department of education now, and we have an EPA, an environmental protection agency, which is going to become a department. All of them overlapping, all of them, uh, causing more licensing and more regulations, all of them doing the work that should be done on a local basis. If the federal government only did what the federal government is supposed to do, we would have a much wealthier nation, and a nation in which all of us would have more years of productive, of productive life. I, do, I want you to just imagine this. Imagine it does come true. Imagine in 2000, we do have a flat rate tax. Can you imagine even the remotest possibility of anyone saying, after it's been established, we'll say in the year 2020, ah, oh, gee, I sure wish for the good old days when we had that 1040 form and we had those capital gains taxes and, and taxes on inheritance and uh, I used to have to have a CPA figure out my taxes and I used to have heart palpitations on April the 15th. Could anyone want that? It's the idea that we've become so used to it that, we had, that this has just become a habit, part of the fabric of American life that has caused tremendous damage and, and damage in a sense that has taken the work of our founders, the very basis of our founders, who wanted such a limited federal government and have now created a massively, a massively bureaucrat bureaucratized government that has jurisdiction almost over every phase of American life. Now, just in conclusion, I'll just tell you what the federal government should do. And uh, if uh, Madison was able to plagiarize from Modus, Moses, I can plagiarize from Madison. The federal government should do five things. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. 
That's it. And that's what I want the federal government to do. And if it adopted a flat rate tax, I assure you that the tax rate, along with the purposes of the federal government, that tax rate would go down so much that we could start paying off that national debt and steal no more from the next generation. Thank you. Yeah, feel free, just because I talked about the flat rate tax, that isn't, I'm not trying to exclude anything. Uh, yes, sir. Are you sure your views were on a balanced budget constitutional amendment? Yeah, I'm for the balanced budget constitutional amendment, but you don't need it if you would adopt this. Uh, the, and I think a balanced budget constitutional amendment is going to go through, and I've, I've always been for it. It does present some problems because then you have to stipulate in emergencies, or war, things like that. Uh, and that was written into the last bu uh, balanced budget amendment than in case of emergencies, and it's overridden by, I guess it was two-thirds of the, of the uh, houses of the Congress. I'm, I'm very worried about the overriding of it for less than what would be an emergency. Uh, I am for it, but I think uh, this would be much more of an ideal. If you just had, by law, and that's all you need, just law, you don't need a constitutional amendment, that we now had a balanced budget flat rate tax, uh, we would accomplish that goal plus a great deal more. But I am for the amendment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Line item veto, I am for a line item veto, too, so that the president has the right to line out those things, line out those things that he doesn't want, that he, that he could, uh, uh, what the Congress has done over the years, as you know, is they've combined any number of things into one bill, uh, and what has become what's called an omnibus bill at the end of the year. It's practically everything in the whole budget. It's all in one, either has to accept it or, or uh, close the federal government down. However, I would just want to say one thing where, in a sense, presidents have uh, not conned the public, but, it, but it, uh, there has been the perception that if a president has a line item veto, he could balance the budget. Not true. Uh, the president submits a budget to the Congress, and if his submission isn't balanced, I would tend to doubt that he would cross out those very things that he requested. I think one way around the whole conflict, which incidentally has been going on since President Grant, he's the first one who wanted a line item veto and didn't get it, is this, because it would give incentive to both branches of government. If the president submits a balanced budget, he gets a line item veto. If he doesn't submit a balanced budget, then he doesn't get a line item veto. And it would give both branches of government incentive to do their stuff. As it is right now, neither one of them have that incentive. How would I propose to orchestrate a change this vast? So difficult, and I recognize it. The greatest difficulty, although there'd be lobbying groups, there's something like 102 that would be opposed to it. That isn't it. I think if you talk enough to the American people and they begin to understand, you can override that. But the greatest, the greatest liability in being able to bring this about is the Congress itself. The Congress gets its power through that income tax code. The power that the Congress and the bureaucracies have is just monumental, and they don't want to give it up. And so when you talk to people in the Congress about this, as I have done for well over a decade, it isn't an argument against it, but you can tell by the look in their eyes they're not for it. They lose the power that they have. The less understandable that government is, and no one understands the code, the income tax code, and no one understands the federal budget. The more complicated things are to the public, the more power the Congress has. It is likely that people think, I don't quite get this thing, but I guess they do in DC. No, they don't. They don't understand it. No one does. But you have, it has this mystery to it of, of well, s someone has to understand this thing, and the the only way that this can be broken down is by the Congress itself agreeing to limit its own power. That's terribly rough. You have to go above the heads of the Congress and, in a sense, above the heads of everyone directly to the public. It was why I was so pleased that President Reagan said very kind words about the flat rate tax in 1982, uh, but I just wish he had gone further with it and talked to the people about it because he had that power. I'm opposed to term limits. Uh, against uh, the uh, belief of most of the people I respect in political life. I'm opposed to them because I believe the term limitation should come from the ballot box. 
And as long as there are good people who are in office, and there are good people as well as people who don't deserve to be, it's up to the citizens to decide who is good enough to keep in office and who is so poor that they should be voted out of office. I don't think we would have been talking about term limitations at all in this country if the great benefits that go to incumbents were all knocked out, all of the perks that they enjoy, all of the benefits that they enjoy. The, the, the real problem is that incumbency has a terrific reward, and the incumbency should not have that reward anymore. And you start right at the base rather than just saying, no, there's going to be a limitation. Secondly, once you limit the terms of members of the House or the Senate or even state officers, the bureaucracy becomes even more powerful because they're not limited and the lobbyists, again, I have nothing against lobbyists, but you have to realize that they become more powerful because they don't have term limits. The only w entities that would have term limits would be those who were put there by the will of the people, and I don't want that. Is regressive? Uh, I, I address it in this way. I have, I have no idea why anyone would call it regressive. Obviously, if you make a million dollars and the flat rate is 10%, uh, you pay $100,000. Uh, incidentally, there, in the flat rate tax plan that I have, uh, there, you pay absolutely zero if you make under $16,000. There's no tax at all, so that there's nothing at all for the poor. I, I certainly understand that. Someone who lives below the poverty line shouldn't have to pay a, uh, uh, an income tax that would be commensurate with others. But then you start above the poverty line, or well, it, this is even more than the poverty line, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. I don't want to see those people who have become successful punished because they've become successful. There are some people who have as a goal, a pursuit in life, to be a millionaire. I have nothing at all against any of those people. My pursuit was to be a U.S. Senator. I didn't get it. But if I did get it, I wouldn't say now that I have six years, I'm going to give uh, two years to Barbara Boxer because she lost and I won. I would never have done that. My pursuit was to be a U.S. Senator. Someone else's pursuit is to be a millionaire. Don't punish them by saying, now you have to get it. You have to give it to the people who didn't uh, attain the same goal that you did. I, I've never understood that and I will, will never understand that. Uh, the rich will pay more because the percentage indicates that they would have to pay more, naturally. But it's the same percent, and that's the way it should be. Wait, who got rid of the deficit? Uh, no, Eisenhower didn't get rid of the deficit. I mean, that just is untrue. We've only had two balanced budgets, let's see, since, 19, well, that's since 1960. There was one in 1961, and there was one in 19, fiscal year 69. Um, Remember this, that there have been years in which the deficit is gone, but not the debt. Two different things. The deficit adds to the debt. And uh, Ike certainly didn't get rid of the, uh, of the debt. Uh, my God, it certainly expanded and multiplied uh, uh, since that time uh, by you know, a, a tremendous amount. But the debt is accrued by a series of deficits. If we have no deficit this coming year, which is not true, but if we had no deficit, that would still mean that we owe $4.4 trillion. So the debt doesn't go down. It's just that it doesn't increase. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm very much for NAFTA. I'm for NAFTA because I'm opposed to taxes and because I'm very high on competition. And I think that the United States always wins whenever it's a competitive effort. And uh, I am. Uh, I'm sorry to say that many of the people who I respect are opposed to, uh, are opposed to NAFTA. But uh, I would like to see free trade with all nations other than those that are totalitarian and hostile to the United States. Yes? How about the Social Security system? Would that be a piece of this flat rate tax? No, Social Security is separate. Social Security is separate, and that's out of political necessity. Uh, let, let me just expand on that a little bit, and it's why I'm so terribly worried about the national health care. Once you get something sewn into the American fabric, getting it out of the American fabric is almost impossible. Anyone with a pocket calculator could figure out how terrible 
The Social Security retirement system is, in comparison with just about any other retirement system that anyone could have on their own through a financial institution. Yet, you speak critically about the Social Security system as a candidate, as I did, and you're writing your own concession speech because it's part of the fabric of America. If you, you can prove to people that they would be a millionaire at the age of 65 if they had just put in the same amount of money into a financial institution, they'll still say, oh gosh, you want to get rid of Social Security. They don't get it. You don't want to get rid of it. You want to put it into a system that is really a good retirement system. But it's a tough one. Now, with, with, so this doesn't touch Social Security. You'd never get it if it touched Social Security. The federal government, you'll understand, does not have a Social Security system. They have their own retirement system, which is so much superior. Now, with national health care, which incidentally will not cover the people in the federal government either, uh, they'll have a much better system. As soon as that becomes part of the fabric of our society, we've had it. Because then a candidate who says, God, this is awful. This is just terrible. Uh, is suddenly guilty of wanting to take health care away from the people of the United States. Really a tough one. It's why I hope this thing doesn't win, because I don't know if there's any going back on it. The beauty of a balanced budget flat rate tax in national health care is this. There isn't anyone in this audience, there isn't anyone in the United States who knows how much national health care is going to cost you as an individual against you as an individual. I don't even know how much the total is going to be. No one knows. If a candidate like President Clinton comes along and says, I want national health care, and you say, how much is it going to cost? If you're now talking in dollars and cents rather than in billions and trillions, that candidate will have to say it's going to cost nine cents more out of every dollar you earn. Want it? You think, holy smoke, I get it for a lot less from Blue Cross or whatever you may think. But at least you know what you're doing. This way, no one knows what they're doing. You know, I, I have the volume on national health care. You can get it from the government printing office. Uh, it doesn't make for exciting reading at night with your bed lamp, but it is a, uh, uh, but it is so complex, it is commensurate with the income tax code. It is terribly complex, and you can just see the complexity that's built into it. And uh, that's why I want it as simple as can be. Okay, it's going to cost nine cents out of every dollar you earn. Do you want it or don't you want it? That's all. And that's what every discussion would be regarding anything Anything at all, any issue, any policy that's brought up. The Department of Education should surely be abolished. Uh, the Department of Energy, uh, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Corporation for uh, Public Broadcasting. Uh, let me go back, uh, Department of Agriculture changed. You can still call it the Department of Agriculture. Uh, the Department of, let me just ask you, is, the, is transportation better now in the United States since we've had a, uh, a Department of Transportation? Is the environment better now since we've had an EPA? Is education better today than it was prior to the time that President Carter initiated the Department of Education? You can go through the whole, the whole list. Uh, and bureaucracies have a way of, they have an investment in failure. If they fail, the assumption is made by the Congress that the reason they failed is because they don't have enough money, and so they get more money. If they succeed, they're cut back. And I'll give you one crystal clear example because it just happened. The most successful department of all in the United States government just exhibited itself in the past couple of years as the Department of Defense in the Persian Gulf War. I mean, incredible, the small amount of casualties for what was accomplished, it's just incredible. What was the reward of the Department of Defense? $122 billion slashed from its budget because it succeeded. If it had only failed, then it could have said, this is what we need to succeed. On the Department of Education, I don't mean to make another speech, but on the Department of Education, uh, I, I certainly brought this up a great deal during the campaign, but then, naturally, a TV commercial was made that I'm against education because I'm against the Department of Education. And let me tell you why I'm against the Department of Education. I'll have to give it to you from a California perspective. Californians send $4 billion to the Department of Education. We get back $3 billion. Okay, $1 billion is mysteriously gone. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that if that's going to be used for those states uh, that have a, a worse educational system than we do, although it now comes to the four that we have about 49th on the list of 50 states. Okay, the $3 billion that we get back 
comes back with a long list of requirements on how it must be spent. Uh, one figure that just zooms back in my memory is $66 million have to be spent on bilingual education. And California doesn't get all of these increments of money, which is its own money, unless it adheres to the jurisdiction that's been established by the Department of Education. Well, why? Why can't we decide how we want to spend our own education money? Why can't we keep all four billion of it and send it to Sacramento, our state capital, or better yet, to City Hall, or better yet, to the school district, and decide how we want to do it? What, what advantage is there in sending it to DC, having them keep 25% of it and tell us how to set, sp spend the other 75%? And our educational system is awful. 25% of high, high school seniors are functionally illiterate. When I was a kid, I was in a high school of 2,000 children, 2,000 kids. There wasn't one illiterate in the, in the school. Couldn't be, because there, you failed. If you didn't know your stuff, you failed. I'll tell you what the greatest incentive to me to learn was. I wasn't a great student, but boy, I sure passed grade to grade. And the reason I did is because there was always some tall guy sitting in the back of the class uh, who needed a shave before the rest of us did and whose voice was deeper than any of ours. That kid failed. I didn't want to be the tall guy in another person's class. That's all. That was my incentive. Now everyone passes. The vote was just awful. I got to tell you that it was, uh, it was another obsession with me, and it was all I was doing for the past uh, almost two months is working on what we call 174, Proposition 174 in California. Failed uh, 70 to 30 percent, so you got to admit that's a terrible defeat. However, the, uh, you know, however, I hate saying however when you lose. You lose, you lose. But it's going, to re it's going to be restored. It's going to be probably on the next ballot. And the one good that came out of it was the fact that every poll, every poll indicates that people are aware that the public school system in California has, is extremely poor. And just knowing that is an advance. Uh, there, excuse me, there were things about the voucher system that people didn't like. Most of it was from false television ads in California, which is so huge. It's like a nation. The only way you can campaign is on TV and radio. That's it. Uh, we were outspent. The 174 forces were outspent about 10 to 1. We had about 2.3 million, something like that, 2.3 million dollars. They had about 20 million, something like that. And it was financed in large part by teachers unions, National Education Association and the California Teachers Association. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I believe that when you lose, you just say you lose, and you lost because it was your own darn fault. Uh, I will say that about my Senate race, but I won't say that about 174. Uh, we lost uh, 174. We knew going in we were going to lose, unless we could get a tremendous amount of money, which seemed unlikely because there weren't any giant organizations on our side. You don't deal with it at all. Real philanthropists are real philanthropists. They don't do it for a tax break. If you have to, if you have to pull on a person's shirt or blouse to say, hey, I'm going to give you this if you give to charity, they're not being charitable. And we were always the most charitable nation in the world long before it became a tax break. And once you start those things, you never stop. There's always something that you have to put down as a uh, exclusion or an exemption or a deduction. Uh, there's nothing wrong with people just giving to charity because they just want to give to charity. You turn it around by recognizing, by recognizing where the responsibility lays, that it does play with the individual and that it does go on to, to the higher brackets of government. And every time you, every single time you go to a higher echelon of government, you lose a certain amount of liberty. It is a difficult thing. Let, let, me, let me just mention a, a, a story to you because it, it has become uh, something that because of our own fires in California, I have referred to, not with great popularity, I suppose. Davy Crockett was a congressman uh, in the United States Congress. And one night, and this is about individual responsibility. One night, he and a number of congressmen were walking out of the U.S. Capitol, and they saw the sky was red in Georgetown. There was a big fire, so they took a hack, horse-drawn carriage, to Georgetown, which is just a suburb of D.C., and helped put it out and save a lot of people. The next day, Davy Crockett and the other congressmen entered legislation to give $10,000 to the victims of the fire, and it passed like that. 
David Crockett was then running for the re-election, and one of his constituents said, Crockett, I'm never going to vote for you again. He said, why not? He said, because of what you did about that Georgetown fire. And he said, well, I tried to put it out. I tried to save the victims, and then I appropriated. I helped to appropriate $10,000. And he said, I appreciate what you did for the victims the night, but what you did the following day was unforgivable. And your reading of the United States Constitution is not accurate. The Congress has no right to give to charity. The Congress has no, whether or not it was $10,000 or $10 million is immaterial. Because once you start giving money to people, rather than the people giving money to you, once you start doing that, you create a government that has jurisdiction over the people. He remembered, I, I'm sorry to get into a long-winded speech, but I want to tell you this. He remembered that, and then two, he remembered it. He won that re-election. And the next year, no, it was two years later, a uh, naval hero died in D.C. who was very well respected. And the con one congressman after another lined up at the well of the House to appropriate a bill of $20,000 for the widow of the naval hero. Davy Crockett got to the well and said, I cannot support this legislation for $20,000 million, uh, $20, uh, for, this, uh, for the widow of the naval, of the, uh, of the hero, the, of, of, the, of the naval hero. And uh, he said, however, everyone in this chamber has the right to give to charity as they see fit if they use their own purse, but not the public purse. He said, I'm the poorest man here, and I will give one week's salary to this fine woman if everyone will do the same. And that'll be more than the bill appropri is appropriated for from the public purse. Not one member of the House would do it. Um, she would have received, I think it was something like $23,000. I forgot what it was, had they all done it. I just want to mention this. There's an afterthought to this, and it happened this year. The caretaker of the Lincoln Memorial died. There was a bill to give the widow $38,500. It passed. If everyone in the Congress had given, if everyone in the House of Representatives today had given their salaries to this fine woman, she would have had one million one hundred thousand some dollars. Uh, but let me, I know the time. No, I'm okay, I guess. Uh, I'm sorry, a speech for a question. My opinion of Ed Rollins' role in the, in the uh, New Jersey election, um, I think he was showing off. I think he was just sitting around with the guys and bragging, and he shouldn't have done that. And it was a, it was just a uh, very, very dumb thing to do. As far as the charge itself, uh, not talking about his dialogue, uh, I just simply don't know enough about it to be a judge uh, of of what he did. If you you never you never pay people not to vote. However, I know that anyone can make the argument. Yeah, but they pay you to vote. You still don't do it not to vote. I have never been a, uh, a um, advocate of get out to vote movements. Uh, never. Uh, because I don't want people voting who don't know what they're voting for. I would much rather that people, I, I'm an advocate of people studying candidates and studying issues and then voting. But at the last day to say, hey, everyone's got to go out and vote is nonsense. If they don't know what the issues are, if they don't know the, uh, the candidates, they could just as likely be making a terrible mistake for themselves. Uh, as, uh, as, as selecting wisely. I was told that I would have won uh, if we had a low voter turnout, so I was inducing all the people who were working for me not to vote. Then I would have... <laughs> <laughs> now, what I really said is that Republicans vote on Tuesday and Democrats vote on Wednesday, but that didn't work. Anything else? Thank you very much.